So we're going to open up some of our PCAPs with the Wireshark. And to start with, I'm just going to open up the first one, Wireshark, name of the file, ampersand, in this case, packet capture one. Wireshark will give you a warning if you're running as a root user because it's kind of dangerous to do that. And it'll also give you a warning if the packet file cuts off because you were using TCP dump and hit control C right in the middle of a message or something like that. So for the most part, for these particular PCAPs, you can just kind of click through that. Let's see here. I'll move this over just a little bit. Okay, so I've opened up the first packet capture and we can kind of flip back and forth between the slides and just run back through them and see what we see. All right, so let's, let's do the search real quick. So first, let's try to filter for certain kind of packets. We don't really necessarily know what kind of packets are in here. One of the very trivial ways to do that is sort by the protocol and just kind of look up and down the protocol list and see what you have. So, so far we have HTTPS. In this case, we really only know it's TLS, so I shouldn't really as assume it's HTTPS, but kind of make an assumption. There's some regular TCP. There's some old school SSL. SSH is the secure shell protocol, the secure terminal. SSDP, so there's some windows about. NTP, network time protocol, often used um, on this particular port by Linux. And we have the NBNS, which again is probably windows. There's some web, DNS, Browser service, this is not like web browser, this is the Samba browser service. And our helper, our couple of helpers, ARP and DNS. So if I want to see just the HTTP packets, I can type in HTTP and hit enter. And if you recall, if I right click on that packet and say follow, in TCP stream or HTTP stream. It's going to reassemble those packets back together into the conversation. And the red is the HTTP request. And the blue is the response for that particular request. And so there's a couple of requests in this overall conversation. You can save this conversation. You can um, save it out in different formats. But if you remember with HTTP and file transfers, if we go over to file and export, we had the ability to export HTTP out and reconstruct it. So we give it a directory. Again, web is not a single file. It's a series of resources that the browser combines together to form the picture of the web page. So I'm going to change into the example directory that I just picked. And inside is these crazy file names of these files. And so um, you can try to browse to them if your browser will do it.
And so, some unfortunately, the name here is messed up, so we probably need to rename our files to something a little bit uh, easier for it to actually work on. But you get the idea is you can export these out and get the objects out of the file stream automatically. So to do that, I would probably pick a, an easier stream to work with. These are um, appear to be advertisements, and the reason I say so is if you reassemble the stream again, this is the get statement. And if you look at the variables in there, like size 120 by 90 and stuff like that, it almost kind of looks like maybe it's an advertisement or something like that. And the response that came back was very small, relatively speaking. Web pages are usually much bigger. It's nothing more than a JavaScript that's pulling down more, uh, more script from this at.atwalla.com address. So you may want to capture a, a real request to like Google or something like that and then dump it to get a little bit more of a bearing on how that feature works. All right, so you can also search for a string. Let's do that. So we'll go to the, the magnifying glass button. Or you can also go to edit and um, pull up the, the wizard. So edit and find packet, and it'll do the same thing. So I'm going to change from packet list is the default again, uh, that caveat we talked about earlier. If you're doing a string search in the content, change it to packet bytes when you're looking for the string. And let me cancel my original filter because I don't think I'm going to find that string in that HTTP. All right, so there's nothing in this particular file by that name. I did find a packet with AT dot in it. Kind of cheated a minute ago. We saw that the JavaScript was being fetched from AT dot at dot com or however you pronounce that domain. And so I just picked a string that I knew was going to be in here for demo purposes. But you can see what it did is it immediately brought the cursor down and it highlighted the first the packet that matched that string first in the packet bytes. You could click find again and see that there's a second packet, a third packet, and a fourth packet that have that particular string in it. So if you're looking for a particular string, that's going to be a really good way to do it. We already looked at sorting the packets, and we can start to do some of the analysis. So for this, I'm going to go ahead and open up a different packet capture. I'm going to open up the second one. And then it was analyze and expert information. <clears throat> so it talks about establishing a send request on 587 and uh, these two computers are talking. So you get kind of a feel for what's going on there. If we go over to statistics, so that was the one that had the capture file properties. It talked about the actual PCAP itself, and you can see it's giving you some information about the PCAP. It's telling you uh, how many packets were there and the average number of bytes. It also tells you when the first packet arrived in the last packet and how long the capture took place.
So if we do statistics and resolved addresses, it's going to create that pseudo host file. This is interesting. We have an email server. At least we presume it is because of the name, smtpcscom. We have a DNS server as well. And all kinds of other hosts that are talking over different protocols. So again, remember the name of the host from certain protocols point of view, like from NBNS protocols point of view, and the name of the host from the DNS protocols point of view, they don't have to match. Because those are different directories that the information is being looked up in. And also DNS tends to be uh, more of a higher level network protocol. And a lot of those reg resolution protocols we looked at earlier, most of them, in fact, were all layer two. So they don't work outside of a subnet. They don't make any sense outside of a subnet. So it's not surprising that you get back a few DNS entries and they tend to be by IP, because that's how DNS works. And then you look up the host names, and they tend to just be by port, but there's not necessarily any IP associated. Still a pretty neat way to get a list of computers really quickly. Also, if you were looking for DNS, like if you just wanted to know what's the IP address for DNS, you know, ABC, that's a really quick way to do it. So the protocol hierarchy tells us that this particular packet capture 2 anyway has got some server message block in it from Windows. It's got the DNS packets and it's probably got some email in it because you see there's an internet message format application layer protocol or encoding being carried by SN SMTP that's almost always associated with carrying emails and that happened to be carried by TCP. So if you're looking for some email messages it looks like Capture 2 is a good place to start based on the, these examples. Check out the conversations from a TCP point of view machine 159 was talking to 142. Looks like two different sessions because the client port was one was 1036, but then it was also 1038 on a slightly different conversation. And you can filter from just about anywhere. So if you right click on a area, you can apply this as your as your search bar filter <coughs> and build up a filter here, which will take you back to your list of packets, but they'll be filtered by whatever criteria you select. So the filters work both to find packets, but also when you're doing statistics on packets and aggregating them, you can use the aggregate itself to find the individual packets that make up that aggregate. So if you want to know the individual packets that make up this conversation, filter on this conversation and you'll be taken back to the packet list and shown just those packets. There's some UDP as well, the time protocol, NetBIOS, DNS. You can look at the endpoints and it'll basically give you the summary that we just looked at, but it's broken out by the computer, by the host. So it's a little bit different spin on that. And we talked about the IO graph. And this graph is particularly severe. We can see that for the most part, everybody's just kind of sitting there. And then all of a sudden, this mail server apparently got an email based on what we know so far. At least that's kind of a good assumption anyway. So we can look at the HTTP request, but this one didn't really have any HTTP of particular interest, it didn't seem like, so there weren't any. But if you go back and app, open up the first packet capture where the JavaScript is loading, you could check out the statistics on that. And under the IPv4 stats is where you'll find those sub uh, aggregates. 
destinations and ports and sorts and destination addresses is good. Here's the destinations and ports. And uh, again, you get kind of a feel for what kind of traffic was going back and forth. But this, when you say ports, you're talking about layer four. So you're talking about TCP, UDP, things like that. So you're not really going to get visibility into the email. If you knew for sure that you were looking for e to see if this packet capture had email in it, the tool would have been the protocol hierarchy because it doesn't restrict itself to just the layer 234. It actually went all the way down mm -hmm. to layer 7. And right there we can see that there's some email. Now if we want to reconstruct that email, we need to actually find one of those packets. We can go back to statistics, right click, and apply as a filter. We can also sort by protocol and just look for like say SMTP for example. So you can see there's, there's a lot of SMTP traffic in here. So we follow the stream and we can see the raw email conversation between an email server. And again this highlights if you want to know why these two computers are speaking this language, we need to go learn how the protocol works. This protocol here is SMTP, or specifically extended SMTP. So we could Google up the RFC on SMTP and ESMTP and we can go read what the protocol says the rules of this conversation are. And just by observing this particular conversation you can get a feel that the client said hello to the server and the server responded back and said hello client and it responded back with the client's host name and laptop in this case. And the server tells us who it is. It's an AOL server and it requires authentication. So this 250 code probably means authentication and it's using start TLS or at least it has it available and it has some other headers as well, email headers. If you're more familiar with HTTP, you can kind of draw a parallel. You know what HTTP headers are in that case, and you can kind of draw a parallel with these headers here as well. Here the client says, or the server says, um, gotta log in. And so there's this blob of text that appears immediately after the login starts. And then there's this other blob, and then there's this other blob, and then there's this other blob. So you might assume that it's encrypted or something like that, but don't jump to conclusions. Check out what the RFC says about email messages and how they're structured. What you may end up finding is that that's not necessarily encryption, it may just be encoding. And if it's encoding, like if it's base 64 encoding, for example, you could decode that. It can, yep. R shark can decode it for you as well. There's also online decoders on the internet. Burp Suite has a decoder. All right, Burp Suite is kind of nice because it's smart enough to, if you put in a blob of text, and a lot of the decoders can't do this. If you put in a big blob of text, it's smart enough to recognize where the base 64 encoding starts and stops. And so even though 334 is not part of the base 64, and there's four lines of base 64 that are intermixed with clear text, it's still smart enough to, you know, know the starts and the stops and decode it. So it's one of my favorite quick base 64 decoders for that reason. That and do a lot of web.
So there's a username and a, and a password, for example. So it turns out it wasn't really encrypted so much as it was encoded. And the RFC on the protocol would, would say that. So the, uh, we also know that it's the, at least at the time, it's the correct username and password because uh, we have an authentication success message. <clears throat> and then the email starts. And so we got a mail from this email address and the recipient is the sec558. And then the data starts, that's the start of the email. And then here's the actual email itself. The email itself has some headers message ID, the from and the to and the subject and the date. And then it has some email headers, mostly vanity banners about Outlook Express and stuff. Encoding declarations. Again, if you're familiar with HTTP, you can probably draw a lot of parallels. Because this part here is text plain. And sure enough, here's the plain text. So heading out of town, Anne is heading out of town. And, and then also, though, there's another type of message embedded in here that starts down here, and its content type is text HTML. So basically, it's, this, it's the same message, but you can see what's happening is, is that the communication is trying to give you the text version and also the HTML version. And the reason is, is that the person who's getting the who's going to read this email they could have their brow, um, their email client like for example if they're using Outlook they might have it set to show plain text only and they might have it set to show HTML you know and both messages encodings are in, embedded in there so using some of the more advanced tools we start to really see how to reassemble and learn what was what was happening, what was going on. And that's the statistics I think really help with that. So we'll go back and look at the statistics and look at the protocol hierarchy again and apply these as a filter. And it filtered out everything that was not an IMF packet. I think we already happened to have reassembled the first one. Let me try the second one to see what happens. Okay, so this is a different email message because this one's not going to sec 558 to say I can't make it. It's sneaky geek again, but emailing to Mr. Secret X. So it's a it's a different recipient, but it's coming from the same person. And that explains the earlier observation we had about how the client initially had a conversation on port 1036 and then later had a different conversation on 1038. And it was two totally different conversations. It's because it was two different emails. And this subject is rendezvous. And there's different kinds of messages encoded in this email as well. So the first one is a multi-part. And it starts out with um, some text. So there's a text part of this email and it says bring the passport and the suit and it's from Ann. And then there's the same message again but in the HTML format. But then this is interesting because there's another part of this email message. There's a, an octet stream encoded inside of it better known as an attachment. And the name of the file is the secret rendezvous docx. And then the actual file starts here at the U and it works its way all the way to pretty far down. And there's the end of the message and then the end of the encoding declaration. <clears throat> dot enter is how a email client ends the data section of a message. It types in a dot and then it hits enter. And then the server said, okay. And the email client quit talking and the server closed the communications.
So let's see if we can save that content. All right, so we got the file out into um, basically a docx, and it looks like, let's see, if we just check the beginning of it, it started with a UE, and if we check the uh, end of it, it ends in DAAAA, so we can kind of see if we copied it correctly. Looks like we got it because there's DAAA there at the end. <clears throat> And so it looks like we were able to copy the document attachment out of the email message. And of course, there are features of tools like Wireshark and Network Miner and stuff that can do this automatically. So don't think you have to do this by hand necessarily. But I would encourage you to try to do stuff like this by hand once to get the feel for what the actual network parsing tools are doing. And then use the tools, of course, to automate the process. I'm going to copy that file over and see if we can get it onto a computer that can understand DocX's. Mm, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if... Oh, okay. It's a zip format. It's a zip container. Yeah, I definitely know there's a lot of different ways to do um, this, this stuff for sure. <laughs> Zipping your zips. There you go. Oops, I should say yes. All right, it looks like we didn't copy it very well, so it's not it's not going to be able to open the document up as well as I would have liked. You can try it on Windows. Well, let's see here. Let's try something else. I'll try a different way. Don't give up. Just keep trying. If we have to, we'll just parse it out with a parser that does this sort of stuff. But it's fun just to try. See if you can get it to work.
but I think you're right. I think we may have to um, we may have to decode it first and get it into a like a the actual format that it wants it to be in. If that makes sense. So yeah, we, we can try again with uh, so we can try to do a file on secret.cockx and it's just text and we can also try to see if we can decode it so let's try um, a64-d secret and just see what happens that looks pretty good because you see how there's a pk at the top here so a pk is a zip zip file so let's try that All right, and then let's try a file on secret two. And it says that it's a Microsoft Word document. So it, it looks like that what we're working through is that the stream that we took out of Wireshark was Base64 encoded to keep the stream from messing up the parsers like the email <coughs> server that had to read this junk. And so it Base64 encoded it to make it safe. <clears throat> and then inside of the Base64 encoding was a zip file in Microsoft Doc X's are in the encoded in the zip format, so seeing that capital PK at the top left was a really good thing. And sure enough, when we went ahead and did the decode and ran file on it again, it said, "Oh, I think it's a Word doc." So now let's copy what we think is the Word doc over to the USB and move it over. So first thing, we need a USB plugged into the the box. All right, and so we'll copy secret two, and we'll take that over to media in the USB to wait for it to, to mount. And don't just take the USB out without unmounting it first to make sure you flush all the data out. Oops, slash media. Okay, and let that sink in. And we'll move the USB back over to the host. There we are, Word doc. <coughs> And so what we have here is the rendezvous point. This is the attachment that was attached to the email. So we saw the email message, which was, you know, grab your suit and meet me there. And then this is the Word doc. Inside the Word doc is embedded another type of file document, a picture. And the picture is a screenshot of Gmail, or excuse me, um, Google Map. And it's showing the exact location as far as Google Map is concerned on that particular day at that particular time. And now you have the address of the rendezvous point. So it took a few steps and it took a few tries and that's okay. You can kind of work through it and eventually you can get there. But I think this is a good illustration um, and we'll appreciate uh, some of the other tools that we're going to look at today as far as their um, abilities. But Wireshark sure did a great job of giving us an idea of what was going on and pointing us in the right direction as to what real life event was happening according to this packet capture that we grabbed.